Billiken fans, welcome back. It's Zach Miller and Peter Hale. It's the Midtown Madness podcast. Before we get going, thank you so much for listening. And uh, I, I know with the with the coaching change, uh, hopefully there will be some new listeners that uh, just based on excitement for the program. So if this is your first time popping in and listening, uh, don't forget to uh, you know subscribe to the podcast, leave a rating. Also, if you're on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button as well as the bell icon. That way you're notified every time an episode drops. Um, thank you all again for, for all your support. It's been, it was been a hell, it was a hell of a season and uh, the, the support through the coaching changes has been great. Um, so we're excited to have some, some new people listening. Uh, it's season four. And once again, the Midtown Madness podcast is brought to you by two men in a garden. Pete, I, I can't tell you how often I see like these subscription boxes with like dorky, like ho homemade jewelry or whatever, all that stuff. I don't get it. I, I don't get any of that stuff. Uh, what I get is salsa. And for March Madness, you better believe I'm going to have two men in a garden salsa sitting right in front of me on my coffee table, right next to the bag of chips. And it's going to be on from 10 30 a.m to like 1 a.m when the game stop i am so excited so excited to dig into two men in a garden during tournament uh tournament time it's local it tastes amazing they've got all the flavors to suit your individual salsa preference my favorite cantina style um you can pick up their many products at any local grocery store or online at two men in a garden.com which if you're particular about your salsa that's where you want to go Follow them on social media at Two Men Salsa on Instagram and Twitter. Pete, I've I want to share uh, an anecdote that we tweeted out, but I want to bring it up on the show. Um, my favorite story from this weekend uh, is the uh, story of uh, Seth Towns. Um, Seth Towns started his career with Harvard in uh, in two thousand sixteen seventeen. He scored 12.3 points per game. Um, the next year, 2017-18, also with Harvard, Ivy League Rookie of the Year. Okay, 2018-19, you'll remember that as uh, the uh, NCAA tournament for the Billikens. Uh, he had a medical red shirt. 2019-20, uh, another medical red shirt. 2021-2020-2021. Um, he transferred to Ohio State, where he reached the NCAA tournament with the Buckeyes. The next year, 2021-2022, another medical red shirt. Now, here's where I don't understand this at all. He sticks with the Buckeyes. 2022-2023, took the season off. What does that mean? I, you know, I remember hearing about this guy a while back, and I don't remember why he did that. Um, I don't know if they were telling him he wasn't going to play and he was thinking about transferring. I don't remember the whole story there. Um, but I do remember him taking that season off after three medical red shirts. And uh, I, I think it had something to do with just uh, just wanting to move on and not lose eligibility. That is that is why. Okay, it says... He was stepping away from basketball. He took the 2022-23 season off. Yeah, vague. I mean, I could see, you know, you've got, let's see, you go medical red shirt, you come back, you're like, okay, I'm going to play. You get injured again. So then when you take that medical red shirt in 21-22, you're like, do I want to try to come back right away? Like, But mm -hmm. I didn't realize that was possible. That's my that's my confusion here because because he returns to basketball and in the 2023-2024 season he goes to the NC he reaches the NCAA tournament with I believe that's Howard right okay yes this this man and he is a a grown ass man uh at the at the ripe age of 26 is playing his last season of college basketball he has been in college basketball Longer than Travis Ford has been the head coach of St. Louis University. A coaching tenure lasted longer 
then this guy's career and his this guy's career went eight years yeah it's incredible class of 2016 that that would have been the high school class that jason tatum came out of um, <laughs> to, to give you an idea of an nba veteran he's an he's uh, an eight-year college basketball veteran ladies and gentlemen it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really, you don't really hear of a guy being around that long. I mean, it's pretty special circumstances. Sometimes you'll get like a BYU guy who's went on his mission yeah. for two years and maybe he's also got a medical red shirt. And so they, they have guys graduating at 24, 25, uh, not that, that infrequently, but, uh, but to do it and not have gone on a mission or anything like that, it's pretty remarkable. I, the other thing, Zach, that I wonder is, so he's only played four out of those eight years. I guess he can't have a COVID bonus year. On oh top of it, right? my God. I think, I, I wonder if he, he spends his co I wonder if that took the year off was the spending of a COVID bonus year. Yeah, it could be. Um, I, 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 I guess that would be the one that would, uh, that would have taken that. Yeah. I mean, six, not, I mean, he would have like, I, I, I think we would have very much appreciated this guy's help. Right. Uh, on, on the court this year, if we could, uh, he would have been perfect. Obviously he, he ended up at Howard, uh, but so it goes. No, he's a good player. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we, we did our live show on what was that Wednesday night? Uh, mm -hmm. by the way, the, 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 the reaction to that, the, the support of that show was awesome. It actually, uh, informed, uh, kind of the way we've talked about going about next year and, maybe looking at Patreon and, and, you know, things that we could possibly do to offer patrons of the show. So that live, that live, um, that live episode was, you know, as much a test as it was, um, you know, staying up to date and in, uh, in the conversation on, uh, the Travis Ford firing. Uh, and that's just it. Travis Ford is no longer the head coach at St. Louis university. Um, what have we seen? We haven't seen much. We haven't heard much out of the athletic department, which is not no, surprising. No, we haven't. And, and we went over in that show kind of the, the chain of events and how everything yep. uh, went down, and, and we're not going to go over it again. But um, w w one of the things they did say, Zach, is that he would have some media availability, right? And it was it was pretty clear. We said that the other night. It was pretty clear the night that this happened that this wasn't SLU's plan on how they wanted it to go down. They clearly wanted to control the narrative, control the media appearances, everything like that, get them back on campus first, that sort of thing. But what we don't have is a timeline. I mean, I thought by now, I thought by the time that we record on St. Patrick's Day, Sunday the 17th in the evening, I thought by now we would have heard something, if not a full press conference, at least like, well, here's what his media availab availability is. I thought maybe there would be a press conference over the weekend with a Q and a, I thought he would do a sit down with somebody friendly, you know, from the local press, but nothing so far. I have no, no. idea what's next. Uh, I, I believe there is, I think we did get, we did hear kind of rumors or, you know, uh, some whispers that, uh, he may be doing an interview with, uh, Frank Cusimano. Uh, mm -hmm. in the coming days. So I, I definitely think that's something to look out for if you really like care to, and I say that I don't want to say it sound mean, but like, I mean, I think a lot of Billiken fans are just ready to, to start talking about who the next coach is of the Billikens. But I, I, I am interested to hear him, you know, now that he's not worried about his job and the team kind of, and I don't know if he'll air all. I would love mm. him to air all. Please air all. Sure. Like I think I think Billick and fans would absolutely appreciate that. And uh whether it's stuff that we don't necessarily want to hear, like that's fine. Um, uh, but I think I think with all the you know, the the last two seasons and the controversies and the ridiculous stories, I, I think it's just time I, I want to hear I want to hear just straight to the point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't mind hearing a lot more as well. Um, I think there's, there's probably certain things that he's can't or not going to say just because he would much rather walk away with a full buyout than yeah. uh, fully air all of his dirty laundry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think as much as we, you know, I, I think as much as we kind of really 
like wore down the Travis Ford is not getting it done here narrative. I think there's another narrative, and I think that has it has a lot of merit to it, is that, you know, um, and, and there's no, like, what I'm about to say has no bearing on whether or not Travis Ford was successful or even did uh, enough to keep his job, regardless of what I'm about to say. And, and what I'm about to say is that I, I don't know how much Travis Ford in his time here was hamstrung by athletic department uh the way they want it to do business mm -hmm. not necessarily so like nil I, I truly i do believe and i do understand that we have a high level of nil for this next coming year but like it would be it's not out of the realm of possibility that slew i mean we talked about they talked about the graduation thing right mm -hmm. and and focusing on players who graduate it, it could be possible that that was an issue i mean there are there are probably a lot of things that Travis Ford could, could point to and say, look, there, I didn't have a fair shake here. And that's, I mean, it is what it is, but at the end of the day, you had, you, you let, like, there's so many other things where you had players in the system and you let them walk and then we had nobody to replace them. So uh, nothing that you can say to, to like disparage the athletic department versus Travis Ford is going to change. Mm -hmm the outcome of the, the coaching tenure here. I don't think. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what, <laughs> what there would be or, or what he could say that would really be that explosive necessarily. Um, other think, than, other than like they were, they were holding money from me or whatever. Like they were right. Yeah. Like some really serious accusation yeah. like that, which, you know, he's, he's just not going to do. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't see that happening though. I think he's going to play nice. I don't yeah. think there's going to be any sort of, uh, you know, lashing out or anything like that. He, he sounded very at peace with all yeah. of it, you know, in the little bits that he said up at, uh, the conference tournament in Brooklyn. Um, so I would imagine after a few more days, uh, of, of perspective and, and, you know, getting out of everything out of the office and all that kind of stuff. I would imagine, you know, going back home and then coming back out to talk to the press and just being calm, you know, and, and just having a lot of a perspective about it all. So I, th I think that's what we're going to hear regardless. He get, he cleans out his own office, right? I think so. <laughs> hmm, I think so. Some... I, I don't think he's handed a box that I mean, I, do I, you, but I, could you, could, is there like, would a coach like hire somebody to do like, no, you know, okay. They, I they mean, it themselves. May, may, yeah, it would have to be really contentious, and I think there's been too much of a uh, a, a wind up here. Uh, like, I think he's had enough runway to go. Eh, maybe what I up? should start, you know, taking some of these photos out and uh, <laughs> <laughs> gathering my stuff. I, oh I, I, man, I, I, yeah, I know it's kind of sad to think about, but it's just he just moved into a new office. Yeah just moved into a new off oh yeah, yeah. I guess that's a good point yeah in the yeah. champion center it's been a year yeah bummer uh one of the one of the bigger stories of the last couple of weeks kind of rings uh you know it, it resonates with billiken fans and that's the uh the uh situation over at um what's his name um long beach state yes and for two reasons actually for two very good reasons. Yeah. Um, Dan Monson being uh, was uh, was fired, I guess, separated from. Uh, Long yeah. Beach the, State. the way that it was worded when it was announced was that they've agreed to part ways, and he was the coach there for twenty years. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He, they fire him, part ways with him. And he goes on and uh, leads Long Beach State 49ers to a uh, to an NCAA tournament. After he being did, fired. he did, and I think there are a handful of coaches who were fired and then still coached the team into the conference tournament. But I believe he's the only one who actually pulled it out and won the tournament. And it's pretty incredible because I mean, some of us had joked about that and thought about that. If Travis Ford is you know publicly fired before the conference tournament and goes and wins the thing what situation does that put us in? And I think a few of us had kind of floated that hypothetical, obviously didn't come to pass, but 
Um, I do I do wonder what the future is there at Long Beach State. That was a firing that really surprised me in the first place, Zach, because he's actually been a pretty good coach out there. And, you know, the, the Big West is not a conference that's getting more than one team in the tournament, period. Uh, full stop. It's just the, the nature of the beast out there. I think the issue there is they really spiked in, uh, let's see here, you know, 20, 2011, 12, 13, two NITs uh, sandwiching uh, an NCAA tournament appearance, uh, putting up pretty big win totals in all those years. He was pretty good, kind of 500-ish after that for a while, made the NIT a couple seasons ago, made the tournament again this year, surprisingly. But I think I think the frustration there was, if you look at his finishes, he was finishing like basically third every year in the league, and <laughs> they just uh, they just couldn't get over the hump. Um so, so that's uh, that. That was kind of the issue. So he's not a bad coach. Always in the mix in the Big West, kind of thing. And and of course, this happens this year. But the other reason, Zach, that it's so interesting, is because one of his key players uh, is a former Billiken. Uh yeah, Lacina Triore. Yeah. Um. Uh, again, this is this. I I, I feel like. This is the epitome of beating a dead horse. Right. But to say that, again, Lucina Triore would have been a serviceable big in the Atlantic 10. Yes, like you said, the Big West, not a great conference, not a good conference. It's a one-bid league, but like big men are, are hard to come by. Skilled big men are hard to come by. Lucina Triore is that. Yeah. Yeah, he's good. He put up, I think, twenty five and nine in the conference championship game. And and look, the Big West is not the A ten, but I have a hard time believing that that doesn't translate a little bit. Right. Um, do we want to talk about the coaching search update? Yeah, I mean, we might as well uh, kind of talk about kind of where we stand with some of the candidates who had been thrown out. A lot changes in a few nights, and and you know, we went over a lot of people in that. Uh, little episode that we did and then obviously the spaces before that so let's let's give a few updates where that, they that was a fun uh the spaces was funny because uh what well, carter chapley was laughing and uh at me uh yesterday in text messages in the in the group chat like um it's everybody's on the spaces talking about slew basketball and at and billick and and chris may and, and travis ford and zach zach's over here like well what about the field hockey field <laughs> but i was like it's all it's all it all comes together into one point. Um uh, that, that was great, Zach. Uh, only you, only you. Yes. Uh let's talk about who is off the board so far. I think the is the biggest name Mac or Holtman that's off the board. And you know, I haven't seen Chris Mac made official it, yet. It's not official, but I believe they there are reports. There are multiple reports. So people speculated that one right away, but now it's starting to show up as like people who are not complete buffoons and who actually are national college basketball writers. You mean on, like us? Like us. Uh, people who actually know things on Twitter saying uh, that it's going to be Mac to Vanderbilt. And if and if that's the case, that's good news because Mac isn't coming from anywhere, right? So he doesn't open up another job. And Vanderbilt had kind of been sniffing around Josh Schertz, who obviously is one of our favorites. So if Chris Mack is the guy to go to Vanderbilt, I think that probably is the biggest name, um, followed by Holtman would be number two going to DePaul, um, which we already knew. That was that was one of the earlier ones, so that was big. But we do have a few more as well. Yeah. Um, well, I, Holtman is, is has been off the board to DePaul. We knew that. Uh -huh. um, and then I guess, uh, I mean – you look at Michigan firing – well, Jake Diebler's off the board. Right, to I, Ohio State. I that love made, Jake Diebler. That makes things easier too Yeah. Um, by them just promoting him. Um, that That's one less coach you know, coming out of somewhere else. But, yeah, Michigan's got the vacancy with Jawan Howard, like yeah. you said. Uh, who else we got out there? Pete, I don't have uh, the list. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, so the other the other like major ones that we need to look out for – I mean, Louisville, obviously, Kenny Payne is gone there. Uh, Michigan with Jawan Howard is 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 one that we mentioned. But Oklahoma State with Mike Boynton is is gone. By the way, the funniest tweet yet oh, yeah. about yeah. who we should go after. I know. And they mentioned Mike Boynton. 
hilarious unbelievable uh, i think you also have to look out west at uh stanford they've got an opening there and then washington although we think it could be the the utah state coach Spring oh i already. thought it was romar <laughs> um west virginia is another one uh, but i think they're going to take a look at some of the coaches that we mentioned the other day um guys from places like samford james madison appalachian state um, you know, a few of the more regional schools down there who have coaches just kind of killing it at that level, um, I think are guys who would be intriguing candidates of West Virginia. So some of them are still going to be active in the postseason, and we might not know about those right away. But anyway, those are the schools that are kind of above SLU in the pecking order with vacancies. It's not a whole lot right now. I don't know if we're still going to see any more in the next few days here. Um, obviously we'll be watching closely, but I don't think any of the other programs are at the level of being able to outbid SLU on a coach necessarily. So, so those are the ones that I would, uh, really be keeping an eye on. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the elephant in the room here. And that's, uh, that's Blake Ahern. What the hell is happening? Why? I don't, I don't, I legitimately don't understand how it's like his camp has convinced everybody in the St. Louis area that's not a Billiken fan mm-hmm. that he should totally be the guy. Mm-hmm. And there, I don't know a single Billiken fan that is actually interested in this guy. I do actually know some Billiken fans, and 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 it, it surprised me, Zach. It has surprised me. Um, because yes, it seems like his dad is his press agent yeah. and see, and it's just one of these guys who's always been around the game locally forever for decades. Um, Blake's obviously been a, a gym rat since he could walk. And, um, and I've mentioned it before I, we went, we both went to the mid County Y as kids and my brother and I would be goofing around in there and he would be down at one end of the court with a clipboard shooting hundreds and hundreds of shots every day. His dad would keep popping in and, and checking on him, making sure he was still doing it. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's, that's what I remember. That's my first memory of him. He goes to, he's a couple years behind me he's in school, goes to DeSmet, uh, do, you know, does well there. And obviously a lot, there's a lot of controversy over whether SLU should have recruited him harder or not. Goes to Missouri state, has a nice career, has a cup of coffee in the NBA and, um, you know, plays pro a couple other places. Uh, actually, I think a lot of places all over the world. And then finally settles into coaching um, G League and then eventually in the NBA where he's an assistant for the Grizzlies now, right? So that's that's kind of his profile. Um, respected coach. Seems yeah. to be thought of as a guy who, who knows the game well. Um, obviously has been around the game his entire life. But not really the profile, I think, of somebody that I that any of us really are thinking about for this head coaching vacancy right now, right? Like, like that's right. a that's a guy. Maybe if you have a relationship with him, or you think he'd be useful to you, and he's interested in shifting from the NBA to college, you could bring him on as player development. But I, I think the issue there is probably a pay cut, right? Yeah, you know, to go do that as an as a college assistant. So if he wants a chance to run a program. I don't know how you go right to slew, right? And 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 nobody's talking about him from Missouri State, which to me would be more of like the logical thing to push him for. Or SIU. Be, yeah, exactly. Because he's an alum of Missouri State or the Valley. And it's it's whether they want to admit it or not, it is a notch down from the A10. And if I'm SLU, I cannot, cannot, cannot get this hire wrong. And hiring an NBA assistant, as we've seen all over the landscape of college basketball right now, is risky. Sometimes it works out, but a lot of times it doesn't. Even when the guy's got a really high profile connections all over the place, because we keep getting told about Blake's connections and, and even when they're alums of the school, right? It's just, it's not always working out. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's really not working out. And it's, it's some of the worst seasons. A lot of the programs have had in recent memory. So I just think it's, it's just a really risky pick, but for some reason, this, this guy, Blake Ahern, a uh, year younger than me and his dad and whoever else is in his camp, they have the local sports media, Zach charmed, like absolutely wrapped charmed. around, wrapped around their finger. Well, and, and why? Like, like, I, I, I guess maybe it's, it's an easy answer to say, Oh, it's their buddy. And they just want access. But like, 
what am I missing here? Uh, I mean, is it is it a is it some sort of you know not a dig? It's it's almost like a backhanded compliment. It feels it, like it feels like they're saying like, man, I, he like it's ridiculous. Like, it doesn't make any. He would be great at it. it. It's like it's a job. I don't know, selling cars. Yeah, you know, you'd be great at selling cars. Well, yeah, and they can- oh, no shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, the car salesman episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, one of my favorites about this very subject. But um, they keep talking about his connections, and it's like. Yeah. It- this isn't like a, a a finance job out of out of an Ivy League school, right? Like, yeah. there's not these like nepotistic backdoor hires that like get guys into the NBA. You have to play in the NBA. You have to be good enough to play in the NBA. Like, just being like, "Hey, I was an NBA coach. I have connections," doesn't mean that his players are going to matriculate into the NBA. That's not how it works. I don't understand that argument at all. And then, um, well, the the argument. So, so this whole saga, it. It culminates in a moment on Friday. Friday, yes. Where uh, I get a tip from uh, a Twitter follower that Slayton has put our podcast name in his mouth. Uh, so I, and the Twitter guy goes, he'll answer if you call. So I text you. I say, should I call? You go, yeah, why not? <laughs> and so I call. And of yeah. course I get on and I give my spiel, like my, I lay it out. And then he asked me, what is the most important thing that kids are looking for when they're looking to play college? Like it, like what is the most important thing to a basketball player? I guess. Yeah. And his point was to get to the NBA. And I can't think of something that means like less as a college basketball coach, like in this day and age, like winning is first. Actually, NIL is first winning is second. And then playing professionally anywhere is third. In my mind, I, I think if you ask recruits, they would still say playing in the NBA is the top priority, right? Um, and on all of them, and, and I can speak to this directly because, like, you know, our coaches would ask these guys when I played at SLU, and all of those guys up until maybe, maybe even senior year, they all still think they can make the NBA, right? Like that it's just uh, our sports pyramid as it exists just doesn't, it's not like this if not everybody thinks they can make the top of it. Are you, and, are you and saying we, this is a scheme? We we know all it can't be possible for everybody who plays basketball to make the NBA because it's less than 500 people in the world and it's 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 incredibly incredibly hard to make the NBA. So is it the most important thing? Sure, if they say it is, it is. But you're right in the immediate uh, you know future, NIL matters to get them in the door. Number one, right? Uh, number two, it's like. Your program has to win to have a coach who can sell something to guys. And, and and these things like build off of each other. There's nowhere that's like an NBA factory that loses a bunch of games. You know what I mean? Like, like all of the programs cranking out NBA players regularly win a lot. You can have lottery picks come from just about anywhere, but the programs that put a lot of guys into the NBA are the ones that are winning a lot. And so I, I think that's kind of getting mixed missed in all of that conversation it's just like there's more to it than just that but number two is like why do you think he's going to be the guy to get them in the nba we've never seen him do that before like he's only been in the nba it's different to go recruit high schoolers or junior college players or guys from the transfer portal and then bring them to your program and then send them off to the nba those are steps we've never seen him take before so to say he's this great nba assistant he can get guys in the nba is already a leap. You know, we haven't seen him do that. So we don't know if he can recruit, how he runs a practice, what kind of offense and defensive schemes does he run? We have no idea. Um, How would he schedule? Uh, There are so many aspects to running a major college basketball program that he's never done before. And and so I I think that's what a, a lot of 
what they're missing here, Zach. But but the other the other thing that they tried to sell you on, and and then me, um, because I ca- I called in after you. Um, <laughs> I, un- unfortunately, I missed Slayton. But the thing that they kept hammering was no. Fortunately, loyalty. you did. Yeah, I guess so. Was loyalty? They said he'd be loyal because he's from St. Louis, so he'd be loyal. It, and we I, should I get a, we should get an athletic department dog if we want loyalty. That's exactly right. But but so I didn't get a chance to rebut that necessarily because he made another subsequent point that I I jumped on a little bit quicker was that Blake's parents think he'd be great at the job and I was just like my parents think I'd be great at the job like like what what parents don't think their kids are the best. Like come on, like that's just not how that's not an there's you don't My mom thinks I'm someone. special. Yeah, that's exactly what he was saying. So anyway, what I want you to break down for all of these guys right now why does the whole loyalty argument just not matter? It doesn't matter because what you're trying to do when you try to find a coach that's going to win and be loyal, you're looking for an absolute unicorn. Like mm-hmm. that doesn't that doesn't exist in the wild. Uh, that o- loyalty only comes really in the coaching realm from being here and experiencing St. Louis and getting to like Travis Ford was not loyal when he came in here. Travis Ford he wasn't. He he came here to rehabilitate his career, mm-hmm. uh, and he would he would have left had he done well enough to leave. Yes, uh, but now, uh, I mean, now saying that eight years on, if he had been successful later rather than earlier, um, uh, that's the ta- That's where it co- the loyalty building comes in, right? So, really, like. It, you're talking about a, a grand slam when you're talking about a guy who can win and he wants to be at your program, right? That's like a, a apparently a Porter Moser, I guess. Um, I, I, I think they, I think Mark Few. Is yeah, Mark what Few. Sorry. Mind. Okay, you're right, Mark Few. But like there, there's a guy who's you're been right. there for. I was for thinking of like a guy decades. up and coming that's that but, still but, hasn't got a chance to do that. I but think yes. they get, when they think college basketball coach, they think of the legendary guys who were at their programs. Shashevskys. Basically, the the generation of guys that has all just retired or right. is about to retire, like an Izzo or something like that. They're thinking of Shashevsky, Bayheim, Izzo. Uh, arguably Roy Williams, who did you and, know, switch at some point, but but I guess Mark Few, Jay Wright could also be kind of be in that mix. Those are the guys they think of like right. this is a college basketball coach, but they don't understand that that those are the one percenters. Yeah, that, that is not indicative of what is happening at the rest of college basketball. It right. just isn't. No, like I well that and like you look at uh. 2000 Bill Self 0304 Scott Drew 0304 uh Leonard Hamilton Florida State 0203 Randy Bennett uh, the, the Mark Few 999 2000 Michigan State Tom So Izzo. these are the, these are the longest serving coaches right Right now. right yeah. right now uh I mean Oakland the oldest is Greg Camp 1984 85 but like that's which is insane that, um, Yeah that's wild But you like that that's the, the, what number number te- eight on this list tied at number eight is tw- 20 years on it's his 20th season that's that's eight just their 20th season like it doesn't come around it is a grand slam to do that and grand slams are hard to hit uh so what slew really needs to do is forget the idea of loyalty sure loyalty is great treat your employee right you know um you know it's not so much loyalty like it loyalty is a dumb way to look at it it's mm-hmm. about it's about mutual um like not the opposite of mutually assured destruction like it's about using using mutually your, beneficial yeah, yeah a mutually beneficial relationship mm-hmm. um and, and so you hire a guy, you got to hit doubles and triples how do you how do you how do you build on a rally, right? You don't hit a home run. Like if you we're gonna build, let's build with Josh Schertz or a Darian DeVries who comes in here for three, four years, does really well, and God forbid if he wants to take another job, see you later. Uh we got a we got a very reasonable buyout for your next employer to to pay and uh 
we'll go ahead and take that money and, and find ourselves another coach who's the next up and coming guy, maybe a little higher. You build on that. You keep building until one day you find yourself in a new conference, a better conference. You All of a sudden, you've made the NCAA tournament once every couple years. You, you've built your program. Then you become a destination job where you can find that, you know, you could hire like a guy like Pat Kelsey right now in this era, you know, down the line, that's the kind of guy you can maybe bring in or a, um, I don't know who else are they talking about now? Um, or Chris Mack, I guess. Why not? Why not? That? So, so, so a couple things that, cause you're absolutely right. If a coach leaves SLU and it's not our decision, guess what? We just made the tournament. Mm -hmm. And we probably made the tournament. Unless you're Indiana once. state. <laughs> it's true. But like at SLU's level, right? If somebody's getting yeah. hired out of SLU, that's the beauty are, of being at this level. Chances are we've just made multiple tournaments, right? And, and we've got forward momentum. If we can hire the next, sorry, the next guy who's going to do that, then we can do it again. And that's fine. And I want to give, I know people get sick of me using this example, but I'm going to use an example called Xavier university starting in 1985 and going for one, two, three, four, five consecutive coaches. They had guys leave their school on their own accord. And um, every single one of those guys just made their program better and better. Like just solidified their image as somebody who goes to the, to the tournament every year. Mm -hmm. And it, they started out in the, uh, you know, I guess they were in the Midwestern Collegiate Conference, and they ended up in the Big East over that run, right? Pete Gillen left for Providence. I know everybody rolls their eyes as him at a commentator right now, but he took Xavier in his, uh, you know, eight, in eight, nine years there, he took them to seven NCAA tournaments. Skip Prosser comes in, takes them to the postseason every year, and goes to um, Wake Forest. Thad Mata comes in, three seasons two second rounds and an elite eight goes to Ohio state. Sean Miller comes in. He makes the tournament in all of his first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, sorry. Sorry. He was only there for five years. He made it in, in, in four of those five, right? Taking them to uh, the second round, the elite eight, the sweet 16, Chris Mack comes in. He's there for nine years. He takes them to the tournament all but one year, takes them to sweet 16, three or four times elite eight, once i mean like it's just incredible every yeah. year right then they then they did make one one bad hire and now they're back to sean miller but my point is like there's a roadmap for this there's and that's just one and that's a school that that zach has half of our attendance it's in a smaller market it has a smaller endowment there's no reason they should have leapfrogged us that dramatically except they just made good hire after good hire and all of those guys left on their own nobody got fired until travis Steele. You know, in, in over 35 years of this pr project going on, and they upgraded conferences twice, and now they're in the Big East and we're not because they were not afraid to be a stepping stone. I mean, like, so, so if, if you want loyalty, fine, you know, but, but I, I don't know what it gets you. I like, I just want somebody who's going to win. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if, if loyalty is learned and they have, er they earn their contracts, I got no problem with that. Yeah, if they if if there's somebody who's that good and wants to be Mark Few and is going to get us to the tournament every single year and develop NBA players, I'm the happiest person in the, the world. But let's figure that out later. Sure, let's, let's make it up. Let's make it a place somebody wants to stay forever. By the way, because right, because if you are a guy who can command three, four, five million dollars at a bigger school and you're getting sick of working for Chris May, <laughs> I'm sorry, you're not going to stay loyal. No. Oh boy, uh, how about Kusamano? On the Ahern train. I mean, like, he really dug in. Like, yeah. He yeah. did a full piece that he, like, tweeted out and then deleted. What? So why do you think he deleted it? That's a great question. Um, what's with the question, Slayton? Um, I'm just trying to put you on the spot. Yeah, I know. You come, at, you come at the yeah. king, you better not miss. Yeah, keep uh, keep badgering me until <laughs> I don't. I, I lose my train of thought. So, Zach, the the only the only part of unfortunately when you went on Slayton, the only thing I heard was the last minute when I or when I seconds him? when he was screaming at you. 
Yeah. Because because basically what he did, if I understand correctly, because I had just come in when he was at the end of this, he basically read Blake Ahern's bio and said, name one other coach who can say that. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's weird because it's like, it's his resume. He's yeah. the only one with his resume. Like, what a weird question. Yeah. Name one other guy. You can't do it. And then he hung up on you because he's uh. an asshole. And, and, and he's, an you know. Look, look, Kevin Slayton is still mad at SLU because we didn't recruit his son, who wasn't a very good, he was a good high school basketball player who became a good division two basketball player. And and we missed out on Umzel's 39th all-time leading scorer by not recruiting him. Hell right? yeah. He, he went to Arkansas State and couldn't get minutes there. So he had to go to Umzel and and becomes a top 40 all-time scorer at Umzel. You know, good job. Good job, Troy Slayton. We're proud of you. Daddy's proud of you. Sorry. That you didn't get a scholarship offer to SLU, you weren't good enough. That's how it goes. Yeah. Kevin Slayton can still be mad at SLU if he wants. He could still be mad at us for not giving Ahern an offer. But I don't think making Ahern the coach is going to solve any of that, even if these guys think it is. You know, Frank Cusimano went to DeSmet. Ahern went to DeSmet. There is something about St. Louis, Zach, that drives me crazy. It's a top 20 media market. And listening to our sports media, you would think we are in a small town in West Texas with two high schools. It's just unbelievable the way that these guys see the world and how they see the programs <laughs> professional and collegiate within our city. It blows my mind how small time we are sometimes. It just kills me. Uh, do you think there, I, I just, I, it kind of occurred to me that there's a little entitlement and I don't even know if I'm talking about Blake here. Cause I mean, well, the, the best part of this whole thing is that he probably didn't even want the job. Well, we have no idea. I know that would be that would just be like the funniest thing is if his dad is just running all over town. Yeah. And Blake's I, just I, like, I don't I, don't I would that. love for him to catch wind of this like tomorrow and be like, Dad, what the hell? Frank, what the hell? Shut up. Uh, yeah. You know, like I don't I don't want that. I'm I'm in the NBA. I don't need this. Yeah, you're you're turning people in St. Louis like you're you're pissing people off. I, I don't know what the money is for an NBA assistant. I think it probably varies, you know, based on on what your role is and tenure and all that kind of stuff. But I can tell you the stress of his job compared to what it would be running a college program is not even close. No. It's just not even close. It's a pretty good life. I got to say that. Pelican fans, we interrupt your regularly scheduled Midtown Madness podcast to bring you some breaking news, Peter. Yeah, Zach, we have some breaking news from Jeff Borzello on X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, ESPN sources with Pete Thamel. Thamel? Thamel? I never knew how to say his last name. Um, T. But Hamill. says, sure, St. Louis is in talks with Indiana State's Josh Schertz to make him the next Billikens head coach. No deal is done, but the two sides are in discussions. Yes, Zach is clapping right now off mic. Um, what do you think, Zach? I, I love it. I love it. And we're moving fast. We got, we, we, un, they understand, like, I get that people are a little concerned about his record, but he, like, look back at his, re like, Indiana State doesn't win in the, in the MVC and they won a, uh, a regular season championship. If you can win a regular season championship in the Atlantic 10, you, you, you tend to go to the NCAA. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's right. He he also, I mean, we, we talked about him a little bit on 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 spaces and on the other, you know, YouTube show, but like he won a lot in a really short amount of time there, right? Like he 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 put together two of the three best seasons they've had since Larry Bird, you know, like like this is not a program that really does well. And should they have been in the NCAA tournament this year? Absolutely yeah. they should have. They're a fun team. They score a ton. And that's that's something that we really haven't covered a lot here is this guy can really really coach offense yeah. like he's probably the most offensive minded coach we've had or, or <laughs> he's not the coach yet but would have had since lorenzo romar um back when we were routinely scoring over 80 now romar was not a great defensive coach but um shirts can really really uh his team score yeah and he know he knows how to run an offense and an offense with purpose and i think yeah. that's something we've really been missing out on and and i not to say that he isn't decent defensively like it's not we're not talking about travis ford in 2023-24 defense here we're talking right. we're talking you know they understand the principles of defense and so yeah. i mean look like uh, they're they're gonna bring some defense it's not 
they 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 they, they won the MVC for a reason, and it wasn't necessary. I mean, offense, sure, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm excited about this. I, I mean, this is the guy we talked about. Uh, am I am I nervous that we have been pushing this guy the entire time, and now this is actually coming to fruition? Of course, I am. I'm terrified. Like yeah, that's we could scary. we could look really stupid in three years, <laughs> but uh, we could also look really smart too. I mean, like- and, and everybody else out there is like, like not to, not to you know, um, kind of deflect from the fact that we've been pushing him really hard. Yeah, but it, it's not just us. He really is like he is the name this this go around for teams at our in our position. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people, um, you know, I, and you do worry about are we too much of an echo chamber with uh, with with people like Jack and West Pine Bills and some of our other other buddies um, around the program who are always talking Bills basketball and you don't want to be that. But I mean, it's a lot of people who have put a lot of thought into this and have looked around at like what's realistic for the program and what's best for the program. And and he really is the one if I were to make a, a graph, he, he's probably in, in the far right point more than anybody else. A little Bon X isn't going to like that far right comment. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, the upper right of a graph. <laughs> where the, the, the X and Y. Yeah, I know. I'm not the X and Y. There you and, go. And, and he's as far up and over. The, a as, quadrant as, system. Yeah. As you can go in terms of like, uh, you know, raising the floor, get re- raising the ceiling. Um, does it make economic sense for the program? Is it somebody who can, who can win in a short amount of time, uh, who might be able to bring guys with them. Um, I, I think there's a lot to like here. And, I, and, I, and you know, Ford uh, will probably have more to say about him in, in, in the coming days and weeks, but, like, he's not a guy who you could always watch and be really happy with what his teams were running and, like, we knew what he was doing. Schertz is a guy I think people are really going to like the way his teams play offense, especially. Jack Godar's tweet is killing me right now. All it's right. just like a big rock band at Denny's playing a show and there's moshing. It's awesome. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's breaking news. Uh, we got it right as we were finishing this episode. So you're going to, now that you've heard the breaking news, you're going to see us uh, learn about that breaking yeah. news. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting, Zach. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously not something we had in the notes, but it's it's not official yet either. So we're going to have to follow up if and when it does become official. But the fact that a, a national source is now tweeting this that's that's more than just the rumors we've heard in the last couple of days. Because yeah. uh, you know, you and I, we always get the rumors, but like this is this is actually pretty solid once you start seeing it reach this level. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Dude, like I just I, I want to see what the future holds for this program. I'm excited that there there's there's hope. It's it, I woke up in a good mood. Like I've been waking up like not worried about the Billikens for like two days now. It's been beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um yeah, this is good and, and a lot more to come. Pete, I don't want to get too into the weeds about the NCAA tournament, but I do want to play a game right now with you. Um, and it is a uh, knee-jerk gut reaction uh, picking of the first round. Um, okay. So here and, we... And Zach, I got to say, the best part of this is because of other obligations I have today, I have not even seen the bracket yet. I didn't watch the selection show. I was just going to catch up with all of it later. So this is my first actual look at the bracket. And I think we're going to skip past the uh, the first four because that's not even real. Fair enough. If the A-10 doesn't have a team in it, it's not real. All right. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the matchup. I'm not even going to say the numbers because that's that that gets that's a little too – like that, that gets in your head. So okay. I'm going to say agree or disagree, and then we're just going to move on. Okay. Like nobody okay. wants to hear us analyze these games, but we're going to play yeah. a game. Um, Michigan State versus Mississippi State. Mississippi State. Agree. Uh, Duquesne, BYU. Ooh, that's not a great draw for Duquesne. Sorry, Dukes. I'm going to say BYU. Agree. Uh, Creighton, Akron. Creighton. Agree. 
Uh, Arizona, Long Beach State. Oh, Lacina, I'm sorry, dude. Yeah. Uh, A- Arizona. Uh, agree. Uh, North Carolina, number one seed against – who's Tibid? <laughs> TBD University. Oh, okay. oh shit. Uh, yeah. TBDU, okay. Dude, should, we should make shirts. We should make Josh oh, sure. shirts. That's great. Yeah. The Josh shirts. Yeah, we should no, seriously, TBDU. Like TBDU. that would be great. Yeah, for the for the play in teams. I think uh whoever the TBD team is, even though we've had a couple sweet six or sorry, sixteen seeds beat. It's not lately, it's not it's, gonna it's be. just UNC. It's UNC. Uh Moorhead versus Illinois. Uh, that, oh boy. What what kind of seeding would that be? Would that be like a 13? Rapid four? fire here, Pete. Oh, Rapid sorry, fire. sorry. Illinois. Illinois. Uh, I agree. Uh, Oregon, South Carolina. Ooh, give me Oregon in that one. Disagree. Um, Dayton, Nevada. Oh, wow. They're getting a Mountain West team. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the Wolfpack. Yep. I agree. Uh, it's in Sandy or it's in Salt Lake, Utah too. Oh, so yeah. Uh, Oakland versus Kentucky. Kentucky. Yep. Uh, McNeese Gonzaga. Oh, that's a fun game. I hate that it's not a power conference program. Sorry, but uh, give me McNeese. Let's do it. Let's yep. do it. Let's ride. Uh, South Dakota State versus Iowa State. Oh, Iowa State. Uh, Tennessee St. Peter's. Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, Texas Tech, NC State. Oh, God. I've just watched NC State win three games in a row. And, uh, ah, screw it, NC State. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't know, but only because I don't know who Texas Tech's coach is right now. I legit have no idea. Uh, Samford versus Kansas. Okay, you is spiraling. Uh, Samford is really well coached, but man, uh, I kind of okay, uh, Kansas. I'll just say Kansas. Sorry. One uh, Washington State, Drake. Drake. Yep. I agree. Uh, Friday, uh, Northwestern, Florida Atlantic. Ooh. Florida Atlantic. Uh, I'm going to go Northwestern. Okay. Uh, just because I hear he's the best coach in the Big Ten. Uh, Baylor versus Colgate. Baylor. Uh, I agree. Uh, San Diego State, UAB. San Diego State. I'll tell I'll agree. Uh, Marquette, Western Kentucky. Oh. Um, oh, was Colec healthy? I is think he he's going to be back. Yeah, give, still give me Marquette anyway. Yep, I agree. Uh, UConn, Stetson. You're taking UConn? Yeah. Uh, New Mexico, Clemson. Wow. New Mexico. Would it help if I told you it's in Memphis? Mm. I'm picking all Mountain West teams too, aren't I? I like that conference. You're a so CBS shill. <laughs> there was I a, didn't realize I didn't realize I was doing it until that one. There um, was a Barstool blogger who pointed out how many Mountain West teams got in and they have yeah. a CBS contract and uh Fox uh has a Big East contract and the compared to the Big East teams. Oh boy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, not a good look. No, it's not, but uh, all right. All right. I'll flip. I'll go Clemson. All right. Clemson. It is. Um, Auburn, Yale, Auburn. Yeah. I don't, I don't want it, but Auburn, uh, Florida on a seven line. I don't know. Against the TBD 10. Yeah. Oh God. It really depends on the 10. Um, I don't love Florida this year. I'll, I'd take the 10. I'll blindly take the 10 that uh, comes out. Yeah. I lo- I also live dangerously. <laughs> uh Nebraska AM from Texas. I'll go Not against Alabama. my instincts and pick a Big Ten team. Yeah, uh, I got I I I'm rooting Nebraska. My customer, the my uh the 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 guy who I my contact and my customer is is a big Brasky fan. Yeah, yeah. Nebraska uh, men and women are fun this year. I'll go. Uh, I like that uh, the one kid that went off the other night. Uh, Duke Vermont. Oh God, that's got to be a four thirteen. 
Uh, nice. Is that what it is? Oh, yeah. wow. Uh, uh, I want to pick Vermont because they beat SLU, and I always want to pick against Duke. Ah, screw it, Vermont. Be, be, uh, be, be, be I'm going to go with Duke on this one, even though it's in Brooklyn. Uh, Purdue one seed, I think you got to, even though they are suspect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Charleston, Alabama. Oh, that's a fun game. Uh, that's a that's a fun game just based on geography. That's it's going to be a high scoring game. Good lord! Neither uh, Alabama doesn't defend at all, uh, but I think they outscore Charleston, Alabama. Uh, my national championship pick against Longwood. It's Houston. Oh, Houston! Yeah, yeah, of course, Houston. Um, James Madison, Wisconsin. Ooh, give me James Madison. Okay, I'll take that. I like your confidence there. Uh, TCU, Utah State. Oh, God. These are all fun matchups, I think. Like, people are complaining about the bracket, and I know why. But, like, all these matchups are kind of hot. I'll take Utah State. Yeah, I, I like the matchups so far, too. Although, I'm, like, I'm, I had, again, I haven't looked at anything yet, but I, I feel like, People are complaining. Like you said, it sounds like Big East didn't get much, but Mountain yeah. West got a lot. So I, I don't know. I got to look through all of that. But uh, but yeah, that's a fun matchup again. And I'll, I'll, I'll show my slew bias and take Utah State. I'm going to take TCU. Uh, it's in Indiana, and you can never count out the cult of the TCU here in St. Louis traveling for that. <laughs> Is that like it's got to be an eight nine game too, isn't it? It is an eight nine yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the Colts of the Grand Canyon versus St. Mary's. Oh wow! Oh, I don't. I see. I don't like this match. Uh, it's, it's in it's... Spokane. Oh boy, boy, oh boy. Um, I don't think that really makes a huge difference. Yeah, they'll 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 give all those kids from Grand Canyon class credit to show up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, like Grand Canyon credit is worth anything. Um, gosh, I, I guess, give me St. Mary. I, I know a lot of people are going to pick Grand Canyon, but I, I really, maybe it's just because I want the St. Mary's, but give me St. Mary's. I think it's St. Mary's. I think Drew is overrated. Uh, anyway, but that was it. That's it. That's all That's the matchups. It? Yeah. Okay. So that didn't feel like it. I'm right. hoping one of our like super loyal listeners keeps track of that. You can like Ooh. keep track of our picks there. Let's see how we did, or or one of us could go back and and write it down. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go listen. I'll, I'll listen back and maybe uh, scribble down what I said. I, I I feel that that was quick, Zach. I didn't feel like we got them all, but I guess we did. I'll take your word for it. Um, yeah, that's it. And hope uh, we did well. Yeah, we, uh, and if we didn't do well, we didn't actually do this. We're going to scrub it from the internet. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I thought this was going to be a shorter episode, but uh, this has been fun so far, anyway. Uh, yeah. Just kind of going down uh, the road, but let's get into some things that happened uh, several months. No, 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 not several months ago. Sorry. Uh, last week. This, this whole week previous. Did we, I went, I feel like the last time we played a basketball game was like, yeah, you're right. Like three or four months ago. I, I think Javon, uh, Javante <laughs> Perkins was still on the team when we played the game, a game last he was. I don't know if my daughter was born yet the last time. I, <laughs> I still have my old car. My car hadn't gotten stolen yet. <laughs> um, no, um, I mean, this really does feel like it happened months ago. Uh, but, you know, uh, here we go. Uh, Gibson Jimerson was named third team all conference into the all academic team. Pete, was it too high? Was this a like this was a legacy pick? It had to be. I, I didn't have him on my third team, and I apologize. But uh, you know, look, all academic team, of course, he always makes that. Yes, um, sir. he was a borderline, borderline third teamer. Uh, I guess let's let's talk about the 74-71 win over Rhode Island Tuesday the twelfth at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Uh, Sincere Parker did not make the trip. Pete, I gotta say, I'm questioning once again the Billiken injury report here. Um, apparently his illness, uh, included posting on his Instagram stories, uh, driving around St. Louis. So, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, what does it matter at this point? Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, by the way, the transfer portal opens tomorrow. That reminds me. It's going to be busy. Yeah. I, 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 Billiken fans, before we get on with this Rhode Island game, uh, brace yourselves. Uh, everyone's going in. 
Yeah, and there's always the chance that they return, but yes. um, don't get too attached to anybody. But I think that's why Chris May said in a couple of his interviews that they they wanted to uh, get a guy in quickly. Yeah. Did we yeah. talk about that that quote where he says they're we, in a position to hire uh, the we, very we best? Talked about, we talked about it in spaces or in our uh, okay uh, YouTube the live. Maybe episode. we'll I, maybe we'll circle back at the end yeah. of this if we. Yeah. Um. SLU had a strong first half in this one, Pete. Uh, they led nine by nine at the break. Yeah. Yeah. And they only proceeded to give up a 72 run to start the second half. I mean, it's just, it's one of those games where you feel like this didn't need to be a close game, but it, it went down to the wire anyway. Yeah. Um, Rody led by four actually with 67, six at led by four, 67, 63 with four minutes and 30 seconds to play. Um, but the Billiken, I, was it Billiken defense or, uh, that, uh, Archie Miller offense? I think it was a little of both because they didn't score again until a free throw with 19 seconds left. Uh, as, as a had a dunk to close it to two medley tied it with a layup two thirty two. So it's not like neither, either offense was lighting it on fire during that stretch. Um, and then I, I thought Zach Jimerson missed a three with like one forty nine left. And I was like, oh boy, that feels you know, like an omen, like that feels like a really bad one. And then URI basically missed one at the other end and then fouled Hargrove who hit both free throws. And now all of a sudden the tables had kind of turned on him a little bit. Um, yeah, I was, I was shocked there. Um, uh, roadie misses, uh, another roadie miss, uh, medley did his impression of Yuri Collins and found Jimerson free under the basket to put the Billikens up for medley was really good in this game pete he was really good in brooklyn period he was really good in a couple games leading up to brooklyn um he all he all of a sudden he went from you know a reserve point guard who had been forced to play hot, bigger minutes to a guy who really matured into a role as a starting point guard and man was he seeing the floor well by the end of the season um it'll be it'll be sad to see him go if that's what ends up happening because um he was kind of developing right before our eyes but he was really great. He was really, really great in this game and the one before. They they traded free throws on the next two possessions, Zach, and then Court Wright from Rody hit a layup with 11 seconds left. They fouled Jimerson on the inbound. He hit the first, missed the second, and Rhode Island had two chances, two chances uh, to tie it from three, but they missed both. Uh, escaped with another one in Brooklyn. Uh, the Billikens didn't shoot well from outside in this one, just 273. Uh, they didn't have much scoring, in, uh, much trouble scoring in the paint, though. They had 44 in the paint. Uh, speaking of the paint, um, Steph Van Bustle in this one. Yeah. Uh, he was, I, I, I like, I am, that kid's got potential. I'm starting to see the, the Brian Conklin comparison that, uh, that Harriman gave uh, when he was signed. Freshman Euro big puts up five and six in this game in limited minutes. And you start to really see what he can be. I mean, his, his rebounding per minute led the team uh, really good presence, interior defense, something that kind of we've been lacking all season long, really liked what he brought. And just like medley, it, it took until kind of the later part of the season, but you could kind of squint and go, okay, I see what we've got here. Yeah. And uh, and there's a lot to like um, for a freshman big there. Um, we'll see if he sticks around. Uh, Jimerson was the leader in this one uh, on offense. 26 points, 5 assists in 39 minutes. Uh, vintage Jimerson. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 39 minutes, by the way. I mean, he's been playing 39 or 40 minutes in, in every game down the stretch. I feel bad for him. Hargrove was solid, too. He had 18 points. And then Azuero had a double double with ten and eleven to go with four assists, which you know that part right there surprised me. I thought he had a pretty good game uh, overall as well. Um, Hargrove is going to be a point of conversation. He was a point of conversation on Senior Night, and he's going to be a point in conversation in our next game for a similar reason, Pete. Uh, yeah. The Billikens only turned it over nine times, and as our listeners will uh, be aware. 10 is the turnover over under what you're looking for when it comes to uh, how well you protected the ball. 
Yeah, absolutely. If you're anywhere close to 10, I'm, you know, you're fine with that. So if I see a single digit turnovers, I, I take it in any game. Um, it, it's twice a, on know, Sunday, twice on Sunday. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Medley himself was good at not turning it over too much and, and, and nine assists on top of it. So that's, uh, that's, pr that's pretty solid right there. It's just, this was one of those games Zach, where it just looked like there were times where, uh, Rhode Island just didn't want to win, especially in the first half. And then it felt like SLU had run out of gas early in the second half when Rhodey took the lead. Um, I think all four pillow fight games were like that, th or no, sorry, three pillow fight games um, were like that on Tuesday. It just felt like close, but not necessarily good games, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just uh, just a lot of crappy basketball. Entertaining crappy games. Entertaining like, because like watch close. Like watching an American Pie spinoff. <laughs> Entertaining, were, but not good. These were the direct-to-video yes. sequels. Uh, direct to video prequels, I guess, for the rest of the uh, the tournament. And I do own all of them. <laughs> that's that's a sicko right there. I I find them very funny. Um, eighty three seventy three loss in the uh, second round of the A ten tournament on Wednesday the thirteenth. Uh, only eight scholarship players dressed for the game. Uh, is that different than the Rhode Island game? I don't think so but it became more of a point of emphasis on this one because i guess because it was the second game yeah so so obviously parker didn't travel meadows had shut it down for the season you've got um dalger who left uh churchich uh, churchich was was shut down for the season and, and why am i forgetting the fifth right now um i don't I, yeah but anyway yeah i guess i guess it was been there true for both games well there would be five there would be um you know, I guess scholarship Triore or not Triore, uh, CSA. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or not right. CSA, um, M Magasa Magasa. Never played. Yeah, right. So there's your five. And I guess it was the same for the, the game before that. But, um, for some reason, it became a bigger point of emphasis in this game. And I don't know if it's just because it was called out and I noticed it. But yeah, regardless. Um, the Billikens put themselves in a huge hole in both halves, uh, 12 to two in the first half and 14 to two in the second, uh, same story against Duquesne in that first half. Yeah. Really annoying. I, I just, a lot of it looked like the first time we played them perimeter defense, you know, just not there. They ended up 10 for 22 from three. And that's only because they only shot seven threes in the second half and cooled off a little bit. They were just getting too much inside too easily. Didn't really need to chuck it. The crazy thing, Zach, is, is when you watch Duquesne play, you would think they're kind of like a St. Joe's that shoots a ton of threes, but they really don't. They're kind of an average team um, in terms of how many threes they take and make in a, in a, in a game. It's it's really, there's nothing there that really stands out. It's just when they play SLU, they, they, uh, they, they shoot the lights out. And um, I guess when you get that much on the perimeter that easily, why not? We're, we're going to talk about it uh, when we kind of review quickly the A-10 tournament, but Duquesne, a lot of lot of parallels to 18-19 Billikens. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, the Billikens were, were a respectable 8 of 20 from 3, but Jimerson was just 1 of 8. He finished with 22 and played 39 minutes once again. Uh, I talked about Hargrove and being a, a point of uh, discussion Ford sat Hargrove for a long stretch in the second half uh, with only one foul. Why? Why? That's a good question. I don't think I ever got an explanation for that. I don't. Uh, he was playing well, I thought. He was playing well. He wasn't in foul trouble. He just like, it's just like almost like he got forgotten about on the bench. I mean, he, he, he finished with 10 and six on the game. He didn't miss from the, the, the field or the line. He just didn't shoot much, but I didn't, I didn't understand why that matchup all of a sudden was not what Ford wanted, or did he just forget about him on the bench? I mean, he did sit there and look, you know, he was engaged still, yeah. uh, definitely wasn't up and, and making noise or anything really like that. From what I could tell, mm -hmm. um, super weird, uh, I, I don't know between this and, and, and senior night, and then kind of the mysterious illness of, of Parker, uh, everything seemed to be kind of falling apart. Um, not necessarily at any fault of, of forward or the staff, but it just seemed like everybody kind of disengaged, 
uh, in some way or another. Yeah, and I don't look. I don't know how much of this was just sort of the um, the tenor of this game, you know, because like every oh. time Slew would start to draw close and make it interesting, Duquesne would pull. Sounds away. familiar. Yeah, I mean, it's just it was just one of those games where I never felt like, you know, like they they would kind of tease you, get to within yeah. two or three or four, um, but you never felt like Slu was really going to catch up and run away with it, right? Like like it was the best case scenario was it came down to a possession or two, uh, maybe free throws, but every time we would catch up, they would uh, they would hit a couple threes and make it a three possession game again. So uh, yeah, we just we just couldn't get back into it, and I don't know if it was frustration exhaustion or, or or what but it just kind of uh it just kind of fell apart uh as a Wiro had six and four all six points cut came at the line very meh to to yeah. less than meh uh hughes had 11 i i really don't know what to make of larry hughes jr larry Hughes the second uh, especially going into a, an off season where you're going to have a coaching change he's obviously uh well liked i think among the fans and well appreciated, but I just, and again, I, I say all this, you know, where these players aren't developing, but I don't know if we had a coach that even took the time to, to, to really focus on development mm -hmm. individual. So uh, I'm anxious to see with this new coach, how these guys kind of react to that and whether or not uh, they stay and, and see if there's any difference in their development or if they make a jump. Uh, but but I'm looking forward to it. Um, Bruce seems to have regressed. Uh, Steph and Bustle, though, I mean, we talked about SVB and, and Medley. Uh, they played like guys that had futures in Division One. Yeah, absolutely, they did. They both looked great. Medley had 15 points and five assists in this game. Steph was solid again. Um, I think both of them, if nothing else, if they're not going to hang around, have made themselves at least, you know, uh, decent commodities in the portal. So, uh, so I, I think they've got bright things ahead. Um, this next sentence you wrote, and so I'm going to let you read it, uh, because yeah. things have changed. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not going to take credit for this one. Well, wait, wait, wait. Are, I guess you're not talking about Duquesne had 16. Oh, no, no, teams. no. I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, then, no, then... I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, <laughs> Duquesne had 16 more field goal attempts than the Billikens. Now you go ahead. Yeah, mostly because uh, they won the turnover battle by eight. But yeah, the, so the last note I wrote here, Zach, is aging like uh, like a glass of milk left in a, a, a sunny windowsill on a hot summer that's, day. That's just cottage cheese, bro. Losing to Duquesne, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote myself, is painful when we see their most hardcore fans on Twitter talking about how great it is to have a coach that won 20 games in back-to-back -back seasons for the first time in five decades. We shouldn't be losing to that program more than about 20% of the time. Fair. That's I mean, fair. No, I just wanted you to read it. Yeah. it's it, it's. I still feel that way, right? Yeah. Like, they're talking about, oh... And and yes, I know we soon this is going to make me sound stupid, but Dan Brod's great because he's got us in better shape than anybody else has in my lifetime. A lot of these guys saying that, and it's just I'm just like Sad. I can't believe that. Like we our athletic director highlighted 20 wins and people lost their minds. Like 20 wins when you're an Atlantic 10 team means nothing in 2024. Mm -hmm. Um. So for them to be like, we won 20 wins back to back, you know, extend Dambra is, is crazy to me, but yeah, it all became obsolete when the rest of this tournament played out. So what do I know? And, and what a sicko tournament it was. My God. I this, mean, this, this is incredible. Like, like, let's talk about this. Okay. We have Fordham, LaSalle and Slew all coming out of that pillow fight. Mm -hmm. Then. In the uh, the next round, you get uh, St. Joe's, uh, the nine seed, taking out George Mason. Mm -hmm. You got VCU, the five seed, taking out 12 Fordham. Uh, Bonaventure, seven, takes out LaSalle. Duquesne takes out the Billikens. And now we're into. So, so, the so basically, chalk. Chalk. You know, like you got a nine over an eight, but everything else played out as expected. Absolutely. Um, so now you have uh, the lower seeds are 
Uh, seven, six, five, and nine. Mm-hmm. And pandemonium ensues. Yeah, because Saint, all four of them went. All four of the top seeds uh, lost. Every team with the du- triple buy, double buy, double buy, double buy. All every team with a double buy lost their first game in the tournament. Amazing. St. Joe's over Richmond. Um, VCU beats UMass Mm -hmm. five and four. Not a big surprise there, but still in the context of the others, St. Bonaventure beating Loyola and then Duquesne beating Dayton is just, it's just unbelievable. And, and Dayton was really our only lock for the tournament. Uh, And I'm sure they got more and more nervous as the week went on because, You've a lot got of bid stealers. One seeds dropping like flies in every conference tournament. A lot of bid thieves all over the place, and you know Dayton is sweating it, um, still thinking they're in, but not knowing what's happened to their seed. And it, yeah, it's just it's just incredible, Zach, to to see this happen. I mean, like a couple of those, sure, not a huge surprise, but like I, I was really surprised to see St. Joe's beat Richmond. Um, never thought Bonaventure was going to beat Loyola again. <clears throat> I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know what to say. I mean, Dayton fans will tell you they, um, they always lose in the tournament, but I guess uh, that's true. Uh, yeah, just an insane, um, a- an insane sicko ass a 10 tournament, uh, leading us to a VCU Duquesne final. And a Duquesne yeah. championship in which the streamers for Duquesne were set off 18 minutes with 18 minutes left to play in the second half. I mean, could this conference get any weirder? Uh, the fix is in, right? The fix is in. I'm sure VCU fans had to be thrilled about that. Um, yeah. Unbelievable. Well, I mean, what? so that was interesting. So, of like, I, like if Duquesne fans want to be the good guys here, like you don't get to complain about the A10 refs trying to steal the game from you. Right. Like you got to just roll with it. You can't you, you've already outlived your hero era and now you're in your villain stage. Yeah. Um Pete are, are you ready for March Madness? I'm very ready, Zach. I I'm I'm as ready as I'll ever be, I guess. And and, and what what snack is going to keep your your energy up when you're lounging on the couch doing all that work watching college basketball on Friday through Thursday through Sunday? I I'm like you. I like nothing better than to kick back with some chips and salsa. It's the best. It's the best snack around. I I I've always liked salty snacks over sweet. I've always liked spicy food. I've always liked nice, fresh, all natural ingredient salsas, and that's what we've got over at two men in a garden.com get over there right now it's not too late get an order in before most of this tournament kicks off and get some salsa in front of you before you spend a lot of time on the couch this weekend next weekend the weekend after that watching these games there's no better way to enjoy it uh you can get all their products at two men in a garden.com 9.99 nationwide shipping get on it right now don't wait and uh and yeah take advantage of that because again no better snack food for sitting on the couch and watching sports um let's talk some baseball some billy baseball pete uh top weekend uh well a a nice little midweek game and then a tough weekend uh with some weather uh some poor weather luck as well in there uh they baseball started out with a 5-3 win over Missouri State on Tuesday the 12th. Cole Smith got the Billikens on the board in the first with a two-run single in the bottom half of the inning. Uh, Missouri State tied it in the top of the second. Uh, Smith had an RBI single to put the Billikens up 3-2 in the third. Ethan Sitzman had a sack fly to give Slew a 4-2 lead in the fifth. That same inning, Smith stole second and went on to third. Uh, on a throwing error with Patrick, while Patrick Closey stole home. Fantastic. Who doesn't love a, a stealing of home? Yeah. Uh, Missouri State got one more run in the sixth, but neither team crossed the plate after that. 
Slew used five pitchers. Owen Kelly started and went two innings. Owen Chaffin went uh, and pitched the three and a half, three, pitched the next three and a third innings. Jeez, figure it out. Uh, and got the win. Jack Weber, Jackson Yarbury, and Ethan Bell finished it off with Bell getting the save. This was the Billikens' first win against Missouri State since 2012. Pete, I was still in college. Yeah, and they actually play this team a decent amount, right? It seems yeah. like we've always got at least one midweek game a season. They normally don't play a full series, but yeah. we've had our shots. We've had yeah. our shots. It's a good program. Yeah, they've got a nice setup down there with the uh, the spring. They use the Springfield Cardinals facility. Yep. Uh, so it's it's a nice little setup. Uh, Missouri Valley baseball is really decent. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about this uh, this doubleheader, Pete, uh, down in southern southeastern Louisiana. That's Sela. S-E-L-A. Yeah, it's not SLU. It is SELA. Um, down in Hammond, Louisiana, I believe is where that's located. Uh, Friday got moved to Saturday because of some uh, inclement weather. And the Saturday game was delayed a few hours, I believe. So they they played a doubleheader on a delay. And uh, the first, unfortunately, Zach, things didn't go our way. First game ended in a 10-8 loss. Um, it was close, but SLU was really playing from behind basically the entire game. Anytime SLU would pull within a run or two, Southeastern Louisiana would just answer in the bottom of the inning. Patrick Closey, Tyler Fogarty, Drew Winters had three hits each. Closey had SLU's only home run. It was a solo shot in the ninth. And then um, SLU used five different pitchers with Jackson Holmes taking the loss. Saturday, game two, kind of went the same way. 9-8 lost this time. But it was unfortunately kind of the opposite story here, right? SLU led most of the game after the third inning, um, but Southeastern Louisiana caught up late, took the lead in the bottom of the eighth, and shut SLU down in the top of the ninth. Hayden Moore led SLU with three hits and three RBIs, along with SLU's only home run. He and Closey had two runs each. And then Charlie Weber started, but Ethan Bell took the loss with four runs in two and a third innings of middle relief. Um Sunday the 17th was supposed to be game three. That was canceled. I don't think it'll be made up. Um, and unfortunately, the two losses lowered SLU's record to 15-3 and three on the season, which honestly only serves to kind of highlight how remarkable they've been. Next, Zach SLU heads to Tulane for a single game on Monday the 18th. I hope they have some fun down in New Orleans. And then they host uh, Cincinnati for a three-game weekend series starting Friday the 22nd. Why don't you tell us what's going on on the other one of SLU's Diamonds? Yeah, I want to make sure. I want to see if we can't let our our listeners know if that game will be streamed. It looks like uh, it very well could be. Um, The Tulane game? Yeah. What the hell? I'm seeing Uh, ESPN Plus. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that'll be great. It'll be evening baseball tonight as you're listening to it. Yep. It'll be fantastic. Nothing else on TV. Um, that's really actually really exciting. I'm actually yeah. hyped yeah, for yeah. that. Uh, I think Tulane is good this year too. I mean, they're always good, aren't they? Yeah, oh I no, think... they no, they are not. <laughs> they went uh, <laughs> oh, uh, they're, they're they're twelve and eight. Yeah, last year they were. Um, hold on, they were nineteen and forty two last year. Oh yeah, but this yeah. year they're still, no, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They're clearly going to be a better team than that this year. They've right. They beat uh, Northwestern two out of the three games. You know they they uh, they swept Yale. Um, they won one of the three against Louisiana Lafayette. A common opponent. Um, they lost by one, just like we did to at Southeastern Louisiana. They took two or three from Pepperdine. So they're a solid team. This will be a tough game. Um, yeah. Let's talk about softball. Uh, seven six loss. Versus Illinois Monday the 11th, facing a 6-0 deficit after four. The Billikens got one in the fifth and tied it with a five-run sixth inning, only to give up a run in the top of the seventh and let this one slip away. Isabel Royal started and gave up those first six runs. Lily Strand pitched three and a third and was great until the last run. Uh, Jocelyn Abbott drove in the only run in the fifth and added an RBI single in the big sixth inning. Uh, She finished two for three with two RBIs and a run. Allie Marietta was three for three with two runs. Jane Kineski, Kineski, uh, Kineski, yes, yes. Jane Kineski had a two-run pinch hit double to tie it, but Illinois put a couple base runners on and got a single to take the lead. With the Billikens unable to answer in the bottom of the seventh, uh, Pete, 
Uh, talk to me about that 3-2 Western Illinois loss. Yeah, so it was scoreless until the bottom of the fifth on uh, you know the, the loss to Western Illinois on Wednesday the 13th. And that's when Natalie Sullivan hit a two-out, two-run double to make it 2 nothing slew. Western Illinois answered the next inning with a two-run triple and RBI single, and that was it. Um, slew only had five hits in this game, but they stole four bases. Isabel Royal had a good start. Four innings, seven strikeouts, no earned runs. Lily Strand came on and gave up the first two of Western Illinois' three runs. And then Taylor Hockman gave up the third and took the loss. Zach, then they had a three-game series against UMass um, this weekend. I'll take game one and then hand it over to you. They won 7 nothing on Saturday in game one. It was scoreless until the bottom of the fifth when Cami Newbanks hit a three-run homer to open things up. Jane Kaniski then sent Abby Mallow home with an RBI single. And a few at-bats later, Carson Janney scored on a pass ball to make it 5 to nothing. Um, In the sixth, Newbanks again, this time with a two-run shot to make it 7 to nothing. Uh, Taylor Hockman was outstanding in this game. Complete game shutout. Struck out four, walked one, hit one batter, and allowed just four hits. Really good performance, Zach. Why don't you run down game two? Yeah, uh, 12-1 drubbing uh, in five. Uh over the minute women uh slew scored once in the bottom of the first on a fielder's choice things got out of hand in the third inning when the bill sent nine more runs across the plate culminating in a natalie sullivan grand slam uh the billikens got one back in the next inning on a solo shot but slew added two more insurance runs after that uh the billikens 12 runs were scored by 11 different players and they had 17 hits in the shortened game abby olsis and cammy newbanks had three hits apiece and Sullivan's Grand Slam gave her the team lead with four RBIs. Isabel Royal pitched all five innings, striking out four, walking one, and giving up five hits. On Sunday, the Billikens dropped a 5-4 uh, loss uh, to UMass, who posted a five-run third inning that included a Grand Slam. Uh, the Billikens answered with two in the bottom of the inning on a Cammy Newbanks two-run single, and two more in the sixth from Jane Kineski. Uh as, as well as Jocelyn Abbott, but ultimately came up short. Taylor Hockman started and went two and a third, giving up all five earned runs before Isabel Royal came on and pitched four and two thirds scoreless innings. The Billikens record now stands at 14 and nine. Uh, the Billikens will take on Lindenwood on the 20th and then a weekend series against St. Joe's on the 23rd being Saturday. Pete, men's tennis real quick. Good week on the courts for uh, the tennis Billikens. 4-3 win over Ryder on Tuesday the 12th down in Hilton Head, South Carolina. They the were swinging down... Billikens. Is that what they call them? No, but I did. I just thought of that. I thought it was funny. Sorry. Down, Go on. down three to one. They came back for a win in their first uh, match down in Hilton Head. They lost the doubles point and then lost to number one and two singles before sweeping the three to six spots with Luca Leonardo, Declan Townsend, Theo Ortiz, and Valentin Vasquez getting the wins. It was a 5 0 win the next day against Hillsdale College down there. After winning the doubles point, Fukushima, Leonardo, Townsend, and Ortiz won singles matches with the other two going unfinished. And then they beat West Virginia State 5 to 2 on Thursday in Hilton Head. Uh, West Virginia State won the doubles point, taking two of three. And then Castellanos, Leonardo, Townsend, and Vasquez won in the two to five spots, with Slew taking the loss at number six and Fukushima going unfinished in the one spot. Uh, next, they have a little break before hosting Butler on March 29th. Uh, what about the women's side, Zach? Uh, the women's continue to roll. Uh, 6-1 win versus Ryder on Tuesday the 12th in Hilton Head. Billikens got the doubles point, and all five singles wins came in straight sets. Noran Hashem, Sandra Ginnis, Emerson White, Fiorella Duran and Lizzie Barlow all notched victories. The win moved them to nine and zero, oh, a record start for the program. Uh, a four zero win over conference foe George Washington uh, on Wednesday the thirteenth in Hilton Head. GW took the first doubles match, but Slew won the other two for the point. Uh, Minnesota Hesham and Jenis made quick work of the Revs in singles play. A uh, 7-0 win versus West Virginia State to, to close out the week in Hilton Head. The Billikens swept doubles in singles, losing 15 games total in singles and three in doubles. 
Billikens moved to 11-0 on the season, extending the record for the best start in program history and one win away from tying the longest winning streak ever. Wait. Ever? Yeah. The longest winning streak in a season is 12 games. The best start is now what they've set already, 11 games. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that we're playing Stanford, but that's that's something. Yeah, they're really good. <laughs> They're they're actually really good. It's, it's we've impressive. always I think women I've always said that SLU being that it, it it has a lot of majors that tend to lean uh uh towards attracting women to them. I feel like we have a really good advantage in women's sports. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I've got, I've got to say I'm I'm impressed with this start. I didn't yeah. see it coming. I mean, uh, just just really impressive so far, and they have a bit of a break. Uh, like the men do with their next match coming against Missouri State on March 26. So I'm not sure if that has to do with uh, spring break or anything. Um, but why don't we, Zach? Do we? We just yeah. got some breaking news. Yeah, we got some breaking. major breaking news. Um, let's. How do you, how let's. Do you, you know what? This? Here's here's what we're gonna do. All right. We're gonna go ahead because we had a plan. We had a plan to do another feature, but I forgot about it. So we're going to end the episode, but you at home are going to hear the breaking news. Okay, does that make sense? Earlier in the yeah. episode. So if you you've already heard this, but this is the this yes. is the inside baseball where you hear the end of the episode <laughs> and you've already got the breaking news. Right. Um let you're going to see my reaction too if you're on YouTube. It's it's pretty humorous. <laughs> um Thank you all so much for listening. Um, this has been uh, an, a great season for us. Uh, we've reached so many uh, plateaus, not plateaus, uh, benchmarks, I think, for the show. Uh, sure. We reached 1,500 Twitter X followers, so thank you. Um, we've reached uh, 125 YouTube subscribers. Uh, we're hitting uh, really nice numbers on audio uh, and video. So, so thank you all and, and keep commenting down below uh, if you have anything to say. Um, but yeah, go Bills. Go Bills.